Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm Khalid. Uh, I work at Oracle. I'm a, a consulting Linux kernel engineer at Oracle. I've been doing kernel development for a fairly long time. I have worked on uh, uh, various flavors of kernel, and I have been working uh, uh, with Linux kernel for uh, 20 years uh, or so. So uh, I have worked on uh, many different subsystems uh, uh, in the Linux kernel. For the last many years, I've been working on memory management subsystem. So uh, I'm going to talk about memory management subsystem today. And specifically, I'll uh, talk about uh, how you go about debugging um, a, a problem in a memory management subsystem. Uh, so uh, uh, I'll talk about uh, how you approach the problem, uh, uh, but then what is more interesting is talking about the real problem. So there was a real customer problem that uh, came my way uh, recently, and um, I, I had to walk through the problem, figure out uh, where the problem was, how uh, how to fix it. So I'll talk about that problem, and uh, in the process of talking about that problem, I'll also talk about the subsystems uh, that play a role in the problem I was debugging, and then um, uh, from there work my way through to where the problem might be, how to uh, zero in on where the actual problem is, and once we know what the problem is, um, how to go about solving the problem. And then uh, beyond that, I'll also uh, talk about just general tools and other, uh, other tips and techniques you can use uh, to uh, solve a problem that uh, uh, happens to be in MM subsystem. So uh, debugging is the uh, part art and part science. Um, so how you approach a problem, uh, you end up having to come up with slightly different uh, uh, approach to the problem every time, depending upon the, what the problem is. But there are general uh, overall tips that seem to work. You um, So uh, let's just go through the uh, uh, customer problem that uh, I had worked on, and then uh, we'll talk about uh, uh, other approaches you can take to approach a, a problem in the MM subsystem. Uh, and uh, feel free to ask questions uh, if something uh, I'm talking about or something on the slide uh, doesn't make sense. So um, how how do you go about uh, uh, solving an, uh, a, a problem in MM subsystem? First of all, something doesn't work right. Uh, very often the uh, problem uh, comes to a developer uh, described at fairly high level. Um, and then from there, you have to narrow it down to where the problem might be and then go further down and confirm where the problem is. So uh, a, a problem might uh, come to me as kernel panic with out of memory uh, uh, message. Okay, but where? Uh, uh, what does that point to in terms of where the problem might be? So first uh, a step is look at what the failure is. What is the information available to you? Do some failure analysis. Um, once you have done, some uh, uh, basic failure analysis, at least we have an idea of where to start looking in the kernel. Um, and once we know where, uh, what are the uh, uh, potential places in the kernel, the code paths that are part of this failure, uh, then uh, we can start developing a strategy on how to go about narrowing the problem. One, uh, one thing uh, uh, I would do when I'm developing the code, if I, I see a failure while developing the code, and I have narrowed down which are the code paths where the problem uh, potentially is, add some dynamic observability to that uh, code path. Um, so I can see, uh, I can get more information when the failure does happen. So one of the favorites for many long-time kernel developers is you just add print case. Print case have their downsides, they also work. You have to use them judiciously. Um, you can add, uh, use a kernel debugger. That works at times. Um, uh, there are also trace points available in the kernel. Many of the trace points are already uh, coded in its uh, a few uh, two three thousand uh, trace points. You can enable them selectively, and then be able to trace where the code is executing. Um, sometimes, uh, depending upon the problem, uh, you may want to know the number of times certain events happen. So mm, you can add counter or you can even use the existing counter that are in place already. So MM system has a large number of counters that it keeps track of. And you can uh, take, uh, take a look at the value of those counters and how those counters are changing can give you an idea of how the system is behaving. So uh, that's something I can do when I come across a problem while I'm developing the code. Um, 
the big issue when uh, uh, confronted with a, a, a bug is, can I reproduce it? If it happens during development, obviously I can repro reproduce it. It's happening on my test system, uh, on my test system. But what if the problem is reported by someone else, especially when uh, it is reported by a customer? Uh, at that point, you may not have access to the system. Um, and um, you may not have option to reproduce a problem. You, you may be able to uh, get access to the system to get some DUA, uh, information, but even that can be uh, difficult at times. Some uh, customer systems are very locked down and there's simply no access. So you have to come up with a different strategy. Um, and um, if you don't have access to the system, the whole dynamic observability uh, approach is out the window. You obviously cannot make any changes to the system. Even if you had access to the customer system, some customers will not allow changes made to the system. Enabling a trace point uh, is likely to get, uh, have an impact on uh, um, a customer system. These customer system could very well be running critical workloads. And uh, while trying to debug a problem, I cannot impact their workload. So when uh, you find yourself in a situation where the problem happened on a customer system, you have no access to the customer system. Then uh, it pretty much comes down to what is the static information you can get from the system. You can't get live uh, uh, um, events uh, happening on the system. You can't uh, uh, add an observability point. All you can do is get the logs. So that is the kind of problem that came my way. It was a customer system, something happened and I, ha I had extremely limited access to the system, nothing more than we can give you console log. So let's talk about that problem. So uh, first of all, the system. Uh, it was a, 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 a two processor uh, system uh, with a total of 96 cores, 256 gigabyte memory. So somewhat of a large system and it's uh, running a workload that uses pretty much entire resources on the system. The uh, uh, CPU usage is maxed out. Almost all of the memory is in, uh, uh, in use by the workload that's running. Um, and the kernel that is, uh, was running on the system uh, is an Oracle uh, Enterprise kernel, which was uh, based on 5.4.17 kernel. Uh, this is not an unusual situation. Uh, most of the customer workloads out there are running uh, potentially some sort of enterprise kernel uh, that may have been uh, delivered by one of the uh, vendors, or it may even have been developed in house. A uh, very few, uh, systems running customer workloads will be running the upstream current latest community kernel. So you often have to debug a problem that's happening on somewhat older kernel. So on this system, uh, the customer, uh, when they need to reboot the system, they don't do a full reboot of the system because of the availability requirement that they have. They cannot spend a lot of time rebooting the system. So, um, they do a k-exec reboot. And I'll talk more about k-exec reboot later. Uh, what k-exec reboot does is it lets you reboot a system a whole lot quicker than full shutdown and restart. Uh, and uh, during uh, some testing they were doing on one of their systems uh, where they were applying um, kernel patches, updating kernels, or uh, uh, updating the user space workload they were running. Um, for many of those changes, once they make the change, they need to reboot. So they would do a k-exec reboot. So they were uh, um, going through accelerated testing on one of the systems where they just applied a whole bunch of these patches, updates, and did just lots of k-exec reboots. And they found that after they had done about 90 to 100 k-exec reboots, the system simply failed to boot. Uh, it printed an out of memory message uh, on the console, and then that was it. At that point, system panicked. Um, so they simply did a, a cold reboot, brought the system back up, put it back in service, and um, I uh, started looking at what happened on the system. Now, the uh, interesting thing is that system had uh, booted multiple times from cold state as well as doing k-exec reboot, and it rebooted successfully every time without ever running out of memory. So uh, the workload sizing was not uh, over provision. It a workload was sized correctly to the size of the memory on the system, yet system ran out of memory. So uh, what I got was the kernel trace, uh, uh, sorry, the stack trace uh, uh, from console. Uh, 
and his track trace on the console looked like this. There was a clear message saying uh, the kernel ran out of memory and the stack trace uh, showed that uh, this kernel was trying to initialize the um, uh, mm struct for a process that it was uh, about to launch, try to allocate a page. Uh, there was no memory available. So uh, it's a critical process, kernel panicked at that point. So that, that was the information I had in my hand and I had to start from there. So any questions at this point before I move on, uh, uh, how I debug the process? There are no questions in the chat or Q&A. Um, if anybody has a question, uh, just and put them in there in chat and Q&A or, uh, yeah, just do that if you have any questions. But there is none at the moment, Khalid. Okay, uh, I'll continue. Okay, so uh, I started digging through the console log. Uh, when the system failed to reboot, um, uh, the customer had captured the console log. I had the entire console log in my hand. I started looking through it and uh, just walking through the kernel boot up sequence, I could see that uh, kernel mounted the root file system and then it had started launching the services. Uh, system D had started and system D had started uh, launching services. And very soon after that, um, we ran out of memory, kernel panicked. So kernel hadn't gotten to a point where we could see a login problem. So there was no way to log in uh, to the system. System was uh, dead at that point. So that's why customers simply cycle power at that point. If you can't even log into the system and system uh, has been uh, a power cycle, there's uh, not a whole lot you can do uh, at that point. So console log was the only thing I could work with. So looking uh, through the console log, uh, one of the things kernel does very early on is it prints a kernel command line that it was booted up with. And that can provide you some clue into how the kernel is being configured. So it's useful to take a look at it. So I just looked at the command line that uh, was logged in the console log. And there are lots of options here uh, in the command line, but nothing that's extraordinary, nothing that would indicate um, a kernel is being configured incorrectly. So looking further down through the console log, I could see uh, that a kernel also prints a, a message uh, saying how much memory, physical memory it has detected. And it prints this message, total RAM covered followed by the amount of memory it has detected. So that message said total RAM covered uh, 262.080 megabytes, which is a, a 256 gigabytes. So kernel did see all of the physical memory, um, and we know the workload is sized to fit in that uh, memory. So we still run out of memory. So something else went wrong. So we just keep going. So at this point, what are the possible uh, causes that would run, um, make kernel run out of the memory? One possibility, of course, is that a uh, DIM module just failed. If it fails, all of a sudden your workload was sized to 256 gig, but now a uh, system actually has less memory than that. Obviously, we are going to uh, uh, try to allocate more memory than we have, but that's not the case here. Because if a memory module fails, you could uh, uh, reboot the system uh, going all the way down to firmware and uh, boot back up uh, from there, that memory module is not gonna come back. Well, sometimes it can happen if it is an intermittent hard, uh, hardware failure, but that's a rare uh, situation. Since customer could reboot the system and see all the 256 gig memory, kernel booted up fully, all the services started normally, we can rule out a physical memory module failure. And then um, the, the next possibility is, did the kernel not see all of the physical memory that was on the system? And uh, we have verified that's not the case either because in that console log I have when kernel failed to boot, um, kernel does report that it saw 256 kilobyte of memory. So kernel did detect all of the physical memory. So that uh, leads us to the third possibility. And that is when the kernel, as it boots up, it will uh, detect uh, how much physical memory is there on the system. And then it has to do some uh, massaging to this physical memory and uh, it gets information about uh, where all, uh, this memory is mapped. So address ranges, and we have got a memory uh, from this address range to this address range and so on. So 
kernel will take all that information and build its own memory map. And the memory map it builds is what it uses to allocate memory to all the processes, uh, drivers, and uh, uh, stacks, and everything else on the system. So let's look at that possibility. Um, so uh, when kernel uh, detects uh, all of the physical uh, memory, uh, it manages the memory in the units of pages, not uh, down to the byte level. So uh, each page uh, has a certain size and page size depends upon the processor. So in this talk, I'm going to focus primarily on x86 64-bit processor, which has a base page size of 4K. So kernel uh, it takes all the memory that's available, chops it up in sizes of 4K and determines, okay, this is how many pages I have got and this is where they all live. So if you look through the console log, at some point after kernel has a, a gone through the process of a, a, um, detecting all the pages and entering it in its uh, memory map, it, it prints a message saying, what is the last PFN it saw? So what PFN is, is P PFN is a uh, physical frame number. If you look at the uh, memory uh, uh, or the address uh, map of a, a processor, it can have addresses starting from zero all the way to whatever is the max the processor can uh, address. Uh, and if you divide this entire address range into pages, in our case, uh, uh, 4K page sizes, you divide this entire address range into 4K pages, uh, each one of these address ranges is a physical frame. A physical frame may have physical memory backing it or not. A physical frame may not even, uh, uh, may be in use, but not by a physical memory. It might be in use uh, for something else. IO might be mapped in there. You might have external sensors that map onto there. So it may not be a physical memory. It can be a, a, an IO device as well. So that's why we talk about physical page versus physical frame. A physical frame can host a physical page and a physical frame can be empty as well. So kernel will report what is the last physical frame number it saw that was populated. So looking at the boot up that failed, uh, kernel reported that last PFN was uh, hex 70,000. If we take 70,000 translated, it translates to a physical uh, frame uh, uh, 458,752. And you convert that to gigabytes, that's 1.75 gigabytes. That doesn't sound right because system is supposed to have 256 gigabyte of memory. And if I, uh, uh, since uh, customer saves, uh, was saving that console log every time they rebooted the system, I did have a couple of uh, other uh, console logs from them. And one of them was a good boot that they did right after they ran into this failure and they reset the system. Uh, I had that uh, console log from that boot as well. And looking at the console log from that successful boot, the last PFN reported, uh, was a very different number, which was hex 4080000. If I translate that to what it uh, uh, converts to in terms of gigabytes, it comes to about 258 gigabytes. That sounds about right for a system with 256 gigabytes of memory. So we are already starting to see that somewhere kernel is missing something. It sees all of the memory, but then reports last PFN is so small. So let's continue with what happened. So as kernel initializes its memory range, uh, as it is reading, uh, uh, figuring out where all the memory is mapped, uh, at the very end, <clears throat> it will go ahead and just print um, all the memory that it found and the address range that it found the memory in. Uh, if the system is a, a, a NUMA system, which happens to be the case with most modern systems, a NUMA system has got memory attached to each processor separately. So, uh, Processor zero might have some memory, which is NUMA node zero, and then uh, NUMA node one, the processor one has some memory, and the processors can access each other's memory. There's cost to uh, accessing memory from one processor to the other. So that's why it's important for us to know where the memory li lives, which NUMA node it is on. So at the end of initialization, the kernel does print the address ranges it saw for the memory. When I look at the uh, console log from a good boot up, I see that NUMA node zero saw um, memory starting from address 1000 to some large hex number. Similarly, on NUMA node one, it saw memory ranging from one address to another. And if I translate those addresses to how many gigabytes of memory it saw, I can see that on node zero, kernel saw 128 gigabytes. On node one, 
kernels are 128 gigabytes. So we got about 256 gigabytes of memory, and that's from a successful boot. Now, if we look at what happened uh, in the boot up where kernel failed to detect all of the memory, uh, kernel um, pointed, uh, uh, printed out uh, the address range for node zero from uh, 1000 to some number. And then for node one, you can see that the range it printed, address range it printed was from zero to zero, which means it detected no memory on node one. And the node zero memory, if you take that address range and convert it to gigabytes, that translates to only 1.75 gigabytes. So for a system that is provisioned to run off of 256 gigabytes of memory, making use of all of that memory, you try to boot it up with only 1.75 gigabytes of memory, we are bound to run out of memory very quickly. And that's exactly what happened. Um, kernel could not uh, uh, start services and things just went wrong from there onwards. Okay, so we now know kernel detected all the memory, but failed to add all of the memory uh, to its memory map. So let's talk about how does kernel go about that process so we can uh, start to understand what might have gone wrong. So the way kernel detects physical memory is when a system boots up, the first thing that runs on the system is the firmware. Uh, firmware will go through the process of initializing all of the hardware that's on the system. Firmware also goes through the process of detecting where all the memory modules are uh, populated. And then firmware will assign, uh, uh, put together a list of the address ranges those memory modules map onto because uh, where the uh, memory module maps onto depends upon which physical uh, DIMM slot you have put the memory in. So it builds this whole table of, uh, I found memory ranging from address this to this, and then from this to this, and so on. This information that kernel builds, it will make this information available uh, to the kernel. And then when kernel starts, it will start reading through this uh, uh, memory map that a kernel provided, uh, sorry, that firmware provided. And as it goes through the process of parsing the memory map from the firmware, it sanitizes it. Um, we'll talk some more about sanitization, but essentially kernel has to make sure that the memory map it got from the firmware looks good and it doesn't have inconsistency. So uh, uh, this memory map, how does it uh, uh, come to the kernel, first of all? When um, system starts booting up, once firmware uh, has completed its initialization, uh, the firmware uh, will invoke the bootloader, uh, which happens to be grub on, on a, uh, a lot of a Linux system. So bootloader starts and bootloader reads in the kernel image from the disk or wherever it needs to get the kernel image from. It gets the kernel image, but before uh, bootloader passes the control to kernel and it starts running the kernel, it also builds um, a boot parameters page, which is called the zero page. It puts a whole bunch of information on the zero page, which includes a kernel command line that we saw earlier. It will be on that uh, a boot page, uh, on that zero page. And part of the uh, information on the zero page is what we call the EA20 uh, uh, table. EA20 table is, is a legacy name, comes from the BIOS days. Uh, mm, but EA20 table is the actual memory map that firmware provided. So uh, bootloader reads the uh, memory map from the firmware, takes a, a memory map, restructures it and puts it a, a, in the structure suitable for the kernel inside the zero page. And, uh, if you want to see what a, uh, the zero page looks like, uh, I have the um, uh, pointed to the definition for a, a struct boot params uh, up here. It's in the boot -param .h file. And it also, uh, you can see in there, there's a, a member in the structure for a E820 table. Uh, each uh, E820, E820 table is really just an array of address ranges. Uh, it, it gives the start uh, point for the address range. It gives the size of the address range, then what type of memory it is. Uh, so, it's just a, a whole list of arrays. Um, now, the thing is zero page is a single page. On x86, uh, a, the single page is 4K. Uh, 
So we can hold only 4K of information on zero page. And that's OK. Um, when it comes to EA20 table, um, zero page can hold up to 128 of these arrays. If we need more than that, which actually doesn't happen very often, if we do need more than that, um, the, uh, we have um, the possibility to store any additional uh, ranges in another structure, uh, which is a struct setup data. And a struct setup data has a, a node called a setup EA to EA20 extended. So we just uh, stuff all of these uh, entries beyond 128 in that structure, which can live on another page. And we put a pointer to that page in, in the zero page. So we can handle more than 128 memory entries. But just keep in mind, 120, uh, 128 memory entries can cover a lot. It takes a very large system with very sparse uh, memory map uh, to run out of 128 memory uh, entries. Khaled, sorry to interrupt. Um, I have a couple of questions that might be good to answer at this time. The first okay. one is in the Q&A box. Would you like me to read that out to you or can you see the question? I can see it. Okay. So the question is, how does the firmware make this information available? Is there a, a certain interrupt to get that information? Um, uh, so it depends upon uh, uh, the firmware. Uh, on the old BIOS uh, systems, uh, you had soft interrupts that you could uh, use to make calls into the firmware and read the data. On the more modern systems, uh, which is EFI based, <clears throat> uh, a lot of this information is passed to ACPI. So firmware has the ACPI interfaces. It publishes what those ACPI interfaces is. So what the bootloader will do is make a call into the ACPI subsystem, and then uh, which is essentially a, fu a function call, and the function uh, will return a pointer to the array. There is a second question in the um, chat. Um, what I answered that question, um, but you, uh, if you would like to add more, what is a node zero or one, and what is meant with the firmware detects memory U boot, and what about the memory nodes in device tree? Okay, um, so um, let's talk about a, a node zero and node one first. <clears throat> So when you have a uh, system with a single processor, a single memory controller, all of the uh, physical memory that is attached to the system uh, is connected to that single uh, memory controller and um, the processor can access any of the memory uh, uh, connected to that memory controller. But as memory, uh, at one time memory controllers used to be external to the processor, but as now memory controllers have moved into the processor. Uh, so when you attach memory, to a memory controller, you are attaching the memory to that uh, to the memory controller on that processor. And then you, uh, if you have a two processor system, each with its own memory controller, you could potentially lay out your motherboard to have DIMM slots on the uh, memory uh, on the uh, motherboard be connected to each uh, one of the processors. And um, one uh, the memory controller for one processor potentially uh, controls. Uh, it talks to uh, a certain number of memory modules while the uh, memory control for the other process talks to the uh, an, a remaining uh, set of memory modules. So what we have is um, essentially two memory controllers and it can uh, scale up. You can go to many more than that. Uh, these memory controllers control their own uh, memory, but they also allow one processor to talk to the memory controller on the other processor going through an interconnect fabric. There is an interconnect fabric between the processors. Uh, a processor can use that interconnect fabric to send a message to the other uh, memory controller and say, I want to read that uh, particular memory that you have access to. So a system like this, uh, what happens is uh, you have memory connected to multiple uh, uh, memory controllers. Uh, when you access um, the memory that is connected to your uh, local memory controller, you obviously have a fairly fast access. But if you have to go to the other processor and ask it to read, uh, uh, you know, read or write the memory connected to its memory controller, uh, you have a certain delay. So uh, such systems are called NUMA uh, uh, systems, which is non-uniform memory access, because uh, the cost of accessing memory differs based upon where the memory lives. 
And uh, if you scale up the system to say eight nodes or 16 nodes, um, you, uh, depending upon what the connect connectivity is between the processor, it may take uh, two halves, three halves to get to certain memory. Hence the cost starts to go up. And that cost matters because if you're running a, a program on one processor and its memory lives on a, me uh, on a memory controller that's three hops away, you are incurring significant cost. So that's what the uh, node zero and one refers to. The uh, kernel will simply uh, number all of these nodes, that, uh, uh, these memory nodes, the, uh, which comprise of the memory controller and the uh, uh, memory modules as a memory node, and it simply assigns them a number. So we know if we are on node zero, we need to access memory that's connected to node one. We know it is a non-local memory, which means it may have extra costs associated with it. So that's what the nodes are. And let me see the second part of the question. Um, and what is meant with firmware detects memory? Okay, so that uh, if you look at the actual hardware, where the dim uh, um, the slots are, when you is, uh, push a, a memory module into a dim slot, you can, uh, the hardware itself can detect if there is a, a memory module inserted into that uh, dim slot. Uh, I'm not an electrical engineer, so I can't give you the exact details of how it determines. Uh, there are potentially sensors, uh, voltage sensors, current sensors that can detect that, okay, this uh, dim slot is consuming uh, current. So there is a, a, a memory uh, uh, inserted in there. Then there are low level protocols as well, where uh, mm, uh, the processor can send out queries and uh, the individual controllers, like for instance, the memory controller might be able to talk to the DIM module and come back and give you information, is there a module uh, inserted in the DIM module or not? So <clears throat> the low level hardware does the hardware detection of, is there a module inserted in the DIM slot? Firmware uses those low level uh, hardware uh, interfaces to detect where the memory is. So that's what I mean by firmware detects memory. And the actual mechanism uh, I'm sure has changed over a period of time as new protocols have, been, have evolved. I squared C is one of them and that uh, has been used to detect what is out there uh, in the hardware land, but there might be more. Okay, um, there is another question at which point would you be able to tell the issue may not be kernel and it may be bad memory dims? I think you have covered that on one of the slides. Right, already. exactly. So if it is a, a, a bad a, a dim slot or a memory module that has gone bad, simply rebooting the system will not bring the memory back. So that's the simplest test. You reboot the system, uh, you can even power it all the way down just in case there was a power event on the uh, system which caused a memory module to stop responding, power it all the way down, power it back up. If you see all the memory, slightly not a bad module. But if you have same address range that is just missing, no matter how many times you reboot the system, then you know the uh, DIM corresponding to that address range has gone bad. And at that point, uh, um, you have to go to lower level than kernel to find out which DIM module uh, has gone bad. And typically firmware will tell you which module has gone bad. Okay. I think there is just one comment in the um, Q and A saying that serial presence detect method is used to detect DIMs. Yes, that is correct. Uh, I have uh, seen it before the SPD, yes. Thank you for that. Okay, so all right, 128 memory entries. That's what we uh, can fit in the main zero page and then uh, rest of the entries go into the uh, extended node. So now as the uh, kernel uh, parses this um, memory map information, um, it, uh, it will build its memory map and that memory map is visible uh, to the user. Uh, for one thing, it is printed as part of the uh, kernel log. So it will uh, be on the console log. And even after the system has booted up and it's fully up and functional, if you ever want to see what was the, uh, how did the kernel detect memory? What was all the ranges that it saw? Uh, kernel publishes the memory map it saw um, 
at a sys firmware memmap. And if you look into sys firmware memmap, uh, it has got a bunch of directories. Each one is uh, one of those uh, uh, EA20 entries. Uh, each one of those entries has a start and, and type. So you can simply cat those files and see what the address range and type was. And at the same time, if you look through the kernel log, the dmessage log, you will see that kernel prints a message saying BIOS provided physical RAM map. This is the uh, a memory map that it got from the firmware. Uh, if there are more than 128 entries, it will print those as well. It, uh, there's a message uh, that says extended physical RAM map, and then it will print the uh, rest of the entries starting from 129. Okay, so, uh, uh, I'm just going to walk through some of the code as I walk through uh, to uh, mm, figure out where the problem might be. So where is the memory setup done? First of all, in the kernel. So there is setup arch function in uh, arch x86 kernel setup.c. So if you go through that, you will see a lot of uh, hardware initialization uh, and uh, much of the kernel uh, data structure initialization uh, it may also be done in setup arch. So in the setup arch function, there's a call to EA20 memory setup. EA20 memory setup is the one that is uh, going to look at the EA20 uh, table. And um, as it uh, uh, sanitizes them, it just makes sure that uh, the address range it got from uh, firmware is not uh, empty, for instance. It doesn't go from address uh, 0 to 0 or address um, uh, x to address x. So it's the same start and end address. Um, there, it ensures that there are no overlapping uh, entries. If there are, it has to resolve those, or there are no entries where the size of the address range is negative, because again, that's that's not a, a correct. It's potentially a bug in the firmware or something else went wrong. So kernel doesn't want to panic simply because it got bad data from firmware. So it sanitizes all of that address range and uses the EA20 update table function to uh, clean up the table uh, EA20 table that it got from the firmware. Uh, and then there might be uh, more entries than uh, 128. If that's the case, then uh, it calls the EA20 memory setup extended function, which will parse the uh, um, uh, setup data uh, structure in that other page, find the setup EA20 extended node, and then all the entries it finds, it, uh, it finds in there, it will add that as well to EA20 table. So once we have cleaned up uh, uh, the EA20 table that we got, from the firmware. What kernel does is it will add all of these address ranges to a mem block allocator. So mem block allocator is the early memory allocator. As the kernel is coming up, it's going to get request to allocate memory. Drivers are getting initialized. It kernel is initializing its own uh, uh, data. So it has to add all of those ranges, address ranges to mem block allocator so it can start allocating memory. So it makes a call to EA20 mem, uh, mem block setup in setup I should do that. Now, one of the things is before we can uh, add all of these address ranges to mem block allocator, we have to make sure that uh, we mark the memory correctly. Some of the uh, address ranges, even though they are present on the system, but they are in use by something else. So the kernel will go through the process of marking uh, uh, address ranges as this one is available, this one is reserved, this one is in use by kernel, and so on. <clears throat> and. Uh, uh, all of this, um, these address ranges that get allocated, uh, that get assigned to mem block allocator, mem block allocator will do the initial allocation. And then at some point when we are done with the initialization, all of this memory is handed over to the buddy allocator. And then from there, buddy allocator takes over and it will do the memory allocation for the system from there onwards. If at any point you want to see what is the uh, a physical memory map on the system, just do a cat on proc IO map. Uh, PROC IOMM shows you how the entire address range is in use on the system. So it will cover not just the uh, uh, RAM modules, it will also show you the address range is allocated to PCI devices or any of the other, say you have got sensor devices that are connected into the system. You can see all of those address ranges in PROC IOMM. So, <clears throat> Uh, I had uh, I mentioned NUMA system before. So one of the things that happens towards the end before we finalize the memory map is uh, we do a NUMA initialization as well. Um, in NUMA uh, init routine does that initialization and NUMA init uh, will use the ACPI uh, SR80 table to figure out which memory is attached to which NUMA node. So now 
uh, we not only know where all the memory is, we also understand how it is uh, uh, configured and um, what would be the cost of uh, uh, accessing each of uh, this memory. Looks like there is a question here. Let me address that before I move on. What is the sanitization of EA20 table? What all things happen during this sanitization? Sanitization is just that. Make sure the uh, address ranges are consistent. Uh, we don't have an address range that starts at an address but ends at a lower address. That's not OK. We don't have an address that has a negative size. We don't have an empty address range. And we don't have two address ranges that overlap. So that's the uh, sanitization. Okay, and then another question is, is the sanitization only required on multiprocessor system or is it something that could be required on single processor system? Yes, it is required on all systems. Single processor, multiprocessor doesn't matter. We have to make sure that the memory information we are getting from the firmware is same. Okay, so moving on. So we talked about how kernel uh, detects physical memory, how it manages it. So let's talk about key exec because that was uh, the other critical part of this uh, issue. Um, normal boots were just fine. If you do a full shutdown, come back up, system uh, never misbehave. It was only key exec reboot that caused problems. So what is key exec reboot? If you look at the normal reboot sequence for a system, you are uh, running kernel normally and you do a, uh, a restart from there. What's gonna happen is kernel, uh, will go through the process of shutting down all the services that are running on the system. And once all the uh, services have been shut down, all the drivers have been shut down, then kernel does a reset. Uh, so it actually goes into the firmware and uh, invokes reset. Once we reset, the system um, automatically makes a jump to an entry point into the firmware. So firmware takes over at that point. Firmware goes through the process of doing all its initialization, all its detection. And when it is done, it will invoke bootloader. Then bootloader takes a little bit of time. It will uh, load the kernel image, it will build the zero page, and then it will transfer the control over uh, to the kernel. And now we, are, uh, we start booting the kernel up. So if you look at these steps, firmware itself can take significant amount of time. And then of course, there is a little bit of time that bootloader uh, takes as well. We have got customer systems out there that have very strict availability requirements. So for instance, if you look at uh, uh, what is considered as five lines, uh, people will promise five lines or six lines of availability time. Five nine is a 99.999% uptime. If you translate that into how much of downtime is allowed if you are promising five lines, that downtime translates to about somewhere between 31 and 32 seconds per year. That's not a whole lot of time. That's all the time a customer has, say, 32 seconds to do any scheduled reboots and unscheduled reboots. So it is extremely important that our reboots be very, very quick. Uh, so what KXIC does is it provides a way to shorten that reboot sequence that we just looked at. KXIC is essentially a bootloader that lives in the kernel. What KXEC can do is while you're uh, uh, still running the system, every, all the services are up, it can load another kernel image and prepare it uh, ready for um, execution. So it will do everything that bootloader, uh, uh, bootloader should do, set this kernel image up, and then we are ready to just jump over to the new kernel. So that's what happens uh, uh, with KXEC. When you do a reboot, you're currently in the kernel, you'll do a KXEC load of a new kernel image, and then, you will do a uh, quick restart where kernel does a shutdown of all the services, and then it makes a direct jump to the new kernel. We don't go through a reset process. We don't go through firmware. We don't go through the bootloader. We just continue with the new kernel. So that can shorten the sequence significantly. And to give you an idea of how much shorter it can be, uh, when I implemented KXEC on IS64, a processor way back when IA64 processors had just come out, I uh, implemented it on, on the McKinley processors. Firmware at that time on McKinley processors took a long time. So the total reboot time on the system was about three minutes or three minutes and, or, or a few seconds. Um, bulk of that time was spent in firmware initialization. So once I implemented KXEC on the IA64 uh, Linux kernel, the reboot time on the system dropped to five seconds. 
So KXF can make very significant uh, difference. If you can reboot your system in five seconds, you have up to six reboots available to you per year and still maintain the uh, five lines. So what are the requirements from KXF? KXF behaves like a bootloader. Uh, it's just an internal bootloader. So one of the things it has to do is it has to make sure that the system, the hardware itself is in the same state for the next kernel as it would have been if we had actually come from firmware into the new kernel. Um, that is, um, it takes some push-ups to do that, but uh, there are enough functions implemented in the kernel to be able to accomplish that. Uh, essentially, um, all of the uh, drivers uh, have shut down routine, which will shut down all the changes made by the driver, uh, undo all of the changes made by the driver and put the hardware in the same state as it was when uh, we got the hardware from the firmware. Firmware has already done the initialization. So we don't need to re-initialize the hardware because hardware will need to be re-initialized if you were to power down the system and you power it back up, the hardware uh, on the system is not in initial state and that's the job of the firmware. So firmware has already done that. Since we didn't do a power down, we can, as long as we can undo all the changes made by the current kernel, we are good to go for the next kernel. So uh, that's a uh, part of the KXEC requirement. The other big one is KXEC has to prepare the, that zero page uh, that was prepared by the bootloader earlier. And that zero page should have all the same information that would have been available to the kernel if it uh, got the control from the firmware instead. Why do we do that? We don't want to special case a K exec reboot in the kernel. That would be fairly extensive, potentially a nightmare to maintain. So kernel shouldn't really need to know whether it got the control transferred from firmware or was it K exec reboot. We have few little special cases, but for the most part, kernel behaves the same, whether it you know, gets control from, from firmware or K exec. So one of the big things is the EA20 table. We have to make sure we get that right. Now, uh, as we talked uh, about uh, uh, EE20 uh, table earlier, we talked about how we uh, kernel sanitizes the table. So it is making changes to the original EA20 table that it got from the firmware. But we know we may need to do K exact later. So as a result, what kernel does it? It maintains three copies of the EA20 table. There's the EA20 table firmware. That's the original table as it got from the firmware. Then EA20 table K exec, which is essentially a copy of the EA20 uh, uh, table firmware, but there are possible modifications. One of them is uh, we could stick an MP table in there for old, old systems before uh, ACPI came around. Um, MP table implemented the uh, multiprocessor specification. That's how kernel got to know what's the um, topology for a multiprocessor system. So if you need to fake an MP table, EA20 a, a, a table K exec is the data structure that will hold that fake MP table. So essentially the two tables are mostly the same. And then we have the EA20 table, which is the one kernel maintains that that's the one that has been sanitized and cleaned up. When K exec happens, we are going to take the EA20 table K exec and copy that into the zero page as the EA20 table. So, now that we know how KXEC works, how memory is sanitized, what happened to all the memory? Um, when we look at the uh, failed boot, we did see that kernel reported total RAM covered 156 gigabytes. Now, uh, since a customer had a, a console log from a few uh, uh, reboots, including some of the successful KXEC reboots, um, I could go through them and make sure that in every one of those reboots, kernel did see 256 uh, gigabyte uh, of memory. And then I started comparing the EA20 map that uh, was reported by the kernel, just to make sure that the EA20 map stayed consistent because now we know that the table provided by the firmware does get modified somewhat by uh, uh, the kernel before it is passed to the next KX kernel. And when I compared the two, I noticed that when I was looking at the console log for the successful boot after uh, uh, resetting, after power cycling the system, there were 15 entries in the map that covered the 256 gigabyte of memory. But the failed KXEC reboot, there were 128 entries. 
That is odd. We went from 15 entries to 128 entries that look suspicious. And then that number 128 is very suspicious because we know maximum number of entries you can uh, add to a zero page is 128. So something has gone wrong in the k exec cycle itself. Then looking at uh, uh, the BIOS EA20 table that kernel prints, um, from the, uh, the boot up that happened after power cycle happened on the system. When I look at the last two entries, I see these two entries at the top. Um, the very last entry, when I look at the address range of that, that is the bulk of the RAM. That translates to about 254 gigabytes of RAM. All the entries above that are much, much smaller. Now, when I uh, look at the failed KXEC reboot, the last entry printed uh, by the kernel had the ent uh, entry just before the one that covers bulk of the RAM. So there was no entry that kernel reported in the EA20 table that would cover all of the 254 uh, gigabytes. So the entry I have here uh, under the failed KXEC reboot, this was the 128th entry. So 129th entry is the one that would have covered all of the RAM. And we need that 129 en entry, which should be in the extended setup data uh, in the um, setup data node. So now I know it's the 129th entry that kernel is not reporting. That's where our memory has gone. Why did 129th entry not make it to the kernel? So I started looking through the k-exec code. And in the k-exec code, uh, there's a function set up EA20 entries. That's the function in, uh, uh, in the k exec that uh, will set up the EA20 entries in the zero page that will then get passed to the next kernel. Well, that at that point, it was very quick. As soon as I started going through the uh, code uh, for uh, set up EA20 entries, I came across a comment that said, to do pass entries more than EA20 max entries zero page in boot param setup data. Well, that explains why 129th entry was not passed to the next kernel because the code is not done yet. KXEC code is not complete in that sense. So that tells me what happened. Somehow uh, we ended up with 129 entries in EA20 table and 129th entry was never passed to the KXEC kernel. That memory disappeared. We uh, run out of memory. Okay, so that solves part of the mystery. The second mystery is, why do we have 129 entries at this point? We started with only 15 entries. We should have never needed 129 entries. So I started looking at uh, uh, the successive uh, boots where I had the console logs. So I had a, a two or three of those. And uh, I just uh, cut out the EA20 table that was reported by the kernel for each one of those boots and it started comparing those. And when I started comparing those, I noticed that from one boot to the next k uh, reboot, there was one entry on the uh, first reboot that had been split into three entries in the next one. So that sounds suspicious again, because <clears throat> uh, it's um, we are expanding the number of entries for some reason, and this is state consistent. I was able to get another uh, uh, console log for a, a KXEC reboot and the number of entries had jumped by a two again. So we will go from 15 to 129 entries uh, as we keep doing a successive reboots because there is an entry that's getting split every time. So it, does, it takes about, a, I computed 57 reboots. One uh, on the 57th KXEC reboot, the number of entries has gone from 15 to 129. And now you start uh, dropping uh, entries and lose memory. Okay, so we know entries are being split, which is why it's growing. Now the question is, why is the entry being split? So I started looking through the code uh, uh, again, and then I uh, found the function that uh, uh, does the splitting of an EA20 entry and does the E underscore underscore EA20 range update. So I looked at which are the functions that call this function to split an entry. And this function is called by uh, two other functions. One is the EA20 range update and another is EA20 range update KXEC. Now, 
the difference between these two is EA20 range update updates the EA20 table pointer that kernel maintains for its current boot and there's a sanitized version of EA20 table. EA20 range update exec operates on the k exec copy of that uh, EA20 table. So we know the problem happens only with k exec. So the function of interest is the EA20 range update k exec. And that's where I can start to see which entry it is splitting, why is it splitting it? So <clears throat> I started looking at who calls EA20 range update k exec, and that was caused by EA20 mem block alloc reserve. Mm, well, that one is of no interest because that function is called only to create a fake MP table entry, which we don't have here. This is an EFI system. It has ACPI on it, so we don't need MP table. So what else? The other caller is EA20 reserve setup data. Uh, EA20 reserve setup data is called uh, early on in setup arch. As we are processing uh, all of these address changes that we saw in the EA20 table, kernel is also trying to figure out, is, is there an address range that's currently in use by something else and should we mark it reserve? And what's happening is, as <clears throat> the kernel goes through this data, it also uh, is looking at some setup data. Uh, the setup data is passed on the zero page and uh, the setup data itself may consume a little bit of memory. So as we go through the address range, if we see that, oh, setup data lives at this address range, we know that address range that we got from EA20 table potentially has portions of it that are currently in use by the setup data. We don't want that setup data over uh, uh, written. So we want to make sure we mark that entry reserved so that mem block allocator does not end up allocating that part of the memory. So what kernel does is in the EA20 reserve setup data, it will take that entry and split it so that uh, if the setup data is somewhere in the middle, it will make the top part of that range available, middle part where the setup data is reserved, and then the bottom part uh, is available again. But then at some point, kernel is done with the initialization. It doesn't need the, uh, that uh, setup data anymore. So it frees that range and that range becomes marked as available. So when I looked at uh, PROC IOMM or uh, even BIOS EA20 table, I couldn't see this range as reserved. It was still marked as usable or available because all the data kernel needed from the setup data has already been consumed. No need to keep it around. Well, looking at the KX kernel, it has to do something very similar. And I started looking at, could it be reserving space for the EFI data, uh, EFI setup data, which we don't need anymore because we are done with it. So could we be splitting an entry in the KX copy of EA20 table when we don't need to? So the first step is, uh, since I'm looking at an enterprise kernel, which is potentially, which is based on an older kernel, potentially there have been changes uh, upstream kernel. So that's one of the things uh, one should always do when working with a, a Linux kernel. It's moving constantly. Lots of bugs are found. Upstream fixes a, a, a number of bugs. So anytime I come across something like this, first thing I do is, has there been a change in the upstream kernel? Has someone seen this problem and solved this problem? or someone fix a different problem, which happens to fix this problem as well. <clears throat> Essentially, don't reinvent the wheel. If the fix is available, just use it. OK, so uh, the kernel I was looking at was based on 5.4.17, but the upstream kernel at that point was 5.18. So I compared the two functions, the EA20 reserve setup data. And uh, <clears throat> uh, comparing the two functions, I immediately saw a change in the upstream kernel which had this comment saying setup EFI is supplied by KExec and does not need to be reserved. That's because KExec synthesizes that set EFI setup data. We have already thrown it away in the initialization. Later, when we are getting ready to KExec, we can synthesize that data again, which is why kernel threw it away early on. And when KExec synthesizes this data, it just reserves a new memory address and it will stick it in there. So now uh, what happens is we have already, already reserved space for this setup data in the uh, EA20 table. And then we have also created a new AFI setup data. So 
we split a, a range for no good reason because we were already going to synthesize this data. So that told me, okay, we are uh, uh, in the older kernel, we are reserving a range and splitting one of those ranges when we didn't need to. And that is splitting is what is causing it to grow from 15 to 129. <clears throat> so I looked at what was a, a commit that brought in that code chain. The commit uh, was simply to not reserve EFI setup data in the k exec EA20 table. But when I went to the uh, commit log, the details, it described a problem where you run uh, into a problem of reserving the EFI uh, setup EFI range over and over again with a subsequent uh, a K exec reboots. It didn't talk about how the system ultimately runs out of memory, but this sounds very much like what I'm seeing, except in my case, we ultimately run out of memory. So simple problem at that point, fixing it is easy. Just take the upstream command, backport it, VIDA. That's the solution to the problem. So that was my journey through this bug. And uh, now I'll talk uh, more about some of the other tools and traps and techniques uh, to debug MM subsystem. But, but before I move on, if there are any questions on this, uh, let me know. I don't see any there questions. Are... In... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, there are no questions in the chat or uh, Q&A at the moment. Okay. So we will move on to how you would go about debugging uh, an issue in the MM subsystem. Uh, very often, since you will find yourself in a situation where you can't um, really make changes to the kernel in order to debug a problem, you have to know what information you can extract from the currently running kernel. And kernel does make a lot of information uh, available. You just have to know where to find it, how to interpret it, and how to then apply it to um, how it might be relevant to the problem you are looking at. So kernel makes information available to the uh, procfs, sysfs, and debugfs. Uh, on most of the systems, um, procfs is already mounted. It's mounted on slash proc. Sysfs is mounted typically on slash sys. Um, DebugFS is not always mounted on a system. Most systems do mount it, but it depends. Um, uh, a lot of uh, vendor distros, I believe, do mount a, a DebugFS, and you'll typically found it, find it on syskernel debug. So each, uh, files under uh, these file systems, they uh, contain uh, lots of counters that count events that have happened on the system. Uh, they count objects that are currently uh, allocated. So Looking at these numbers, it can give you an idea of what's happening with the MM subsystem. Um, what's the current state? And if you have some historical information, you can also see how the state of the system has changed. So to uh, understand uh, the files and, and the counters and events that you see in these file systems, uh, this documentation, if you go into the uh, kernel sources directory and actually kernel.org, uh, uh, also uh, has all of this doc uh, uh, documentation online. Um, proc is documented under doc documentation file systems, proc.txt. Sysfs is documented under uh, uh, documentation file systems. And then uh, uh, there's also a directory uh, documentation admin guide mm. This whole bunch of files in there, it's worth going through those. Um, most of the files are fairly up to date. Some uh, might be missing a counter here and there but that's no big deal. You can figure out what that counter means. So one of the uh, important things to know is that the files that live under proc, sys, or syskernel debug, the files that give you these counters, those are uh, updated dynamically. So at the, at the moment you do a cat, it will give you the current uh, state of those counters. So I'll, I'll talk about some of those files and talk about it where those counters are coming from that uh, then you can uh, understand what those counters mean because you see a number in uh, you look at proc mem info there is a number there what does that number mean if you can correlate it uh, uh, correlate it with the, a variable in the uh, source code you can understand what that number means so let's look at proc mem info proc mem info data is populated uh, by mem info proc show function and that function lives in fsproc meminfo.c. Um, so 
if you do a cat proc mem info, you see a counter, just go look at that function and you can see which uh, variable did the kernel read to populate that number. There are a few very interesting counters. I use them all the time. Anytime I'm looking at a, a anomaly in the MM subsystem, some of the numbers I look at to see what might be happening. There's, there's a lot more. I can cover only a few here. So memory just tells you how much memory is uh, uh, available on the free list. Uh, mem available is a slightly different number. Mem free is the number you get uh, for the memory that can be allocated immediately. But there's a lot of memory on the system that can potentially be tied in, in buffer cache and page cache. A lot of that memory is reclaimable. And actually I had another talk about memory reclamation. So you can uh, uh, go through that talk to see what does memory reclamation mean. But essentially it's memory that's sitting out there uh, currently allocated, but not really in use, and it can be reclaimed and made available. So that's what the mem available number says. That here's how much memory I can make available through reclamation. Cache uh, uh, tells you how much memory is consumed in the page cache. Uh, m log processes can call uh, m log. When they call m log, they essentially can take a range of uh, pages and just log them in memory which means you cannot reclaim them, you cannot solve them. So it's good to know how much memory is logged up that cannot be touched. mlog will give you that number. And then slab is another interesting one. Slab is essentially a cache of objects. So if a kernel is going to uh, allocate a type of object over and over again, which it does for loss of its data structures, <clears throat> you can do a malloc every time, but uh, you end up uh, with an inefficient allocation. So kernel simplifies it. it, it makes a slab allocator available. You can allocate a cache of objects and then you can simply ask for a, yet another instance of objects. So slab allocator will just grab a chunk of memory based upon the size of the cache you want. It keeps that cache handy. Anytime you want an ob a space for object, you ask for uh, that space and you return it when you're done with it. So slab uh, uh, counter will tell you how much memory is consumed by slab objects. And then of course, the huge pages total is a useful one. This is the one that is used by huge TLBFS. So the pages uh, that are allocated for huge TLBFS, they are essentially not available. They are used only by huge TLBFS. So knowing how much of memory is consumed there is important. Khaled, there are a few questions now in, uh, uh, there is a chat, a question in the chat about uh, MM in it. Uh -huh. Can you see that one? Or yes, do I... I can see. Okay. Sure. <clears throat> okay, so the question is MM in it after setup arch, um, where does kernel memory uh, mapping? This is the point where it gets access to all memory as it walks through all pages and marked it. So before remember, kernel does walk through all ranges, which he also does in MM in it. Is that right to say? See, it impacts boot time. So I'm not sure what you mean by kernel walks all the uh, memory because it, it's not going to walk as in ensure uh, you can read and write all of the uh, memory that is being reported by EA20 table. Uh, and you can force it to do that, but that's not what kernel typically does. It will simply uh, um, add all the pages, it finds in those address ranges to the mem block allocator, which then finally gets handed over to the buddy allocator. Um, Pages typically in the kernel are not zeroed out until they are allocated. It's at allocation time that we walk through the page and write zeros to all of it to make sure that we don't leak data. Because if a user comes along, asks for memory, and we give it memory without zeroing out the page, we obviously leak memory from the last user of that page to this new process. Um, so kernel really just walks the ranges to uh, uh, walks in the sense that it ensures that the range is valid, it looks good, it's uh, consistent, and there are no overlaps. Okay, and then there is a question in the Q&A. Uh, there is also a hand up. Sumitra Sharma, would you like to ask your question or uh, would you like to type that in? Okay. Uh, while uh, Sumitra asks her question, there is the one in uh, Q&A. Okay. Okay, so this one is, we are seeing issues where we don't leave, lose memory, but 
cached so aggressively and get memory highly fragmented that when the time comes to allocate a large block of memory, the OOM Reaper gets activated. Yeah, I have seen those. It's an ARM embedded system, 4.14.2 with 768 uh, megabytes of memory. Um, yeah, I covered some of it in my uh, other talk uh, about mem optimizer. Uh, that's a tool uh, I have written. That mem optimizer tool now is called Adaptive MM because it does more than just uh, what uh, original mem optimizer does. Uh, but essentially, what you're talking about is uh, as memory uh, is being allocated, um, some of the memory ends up in buffer cache or page cache. And even though the ref count on the pages that are sitting in, uh, in the cache, is zero, those pages are just sitting there idle and have not been reclaimed. Until those pages are reclaimed, um, you cannot put them in this string of pages that are available contiguously. So for instance, if you have got a, a heavy fragmentation and you try to allocate a huge page, huge page can be two megabytes or even a gigabyte on x86. Um, you might be able to get a 4K page, but to get a huge page, you need to get 512 of these consecutively to be able to allocate a single huge page. And if you are in that situation where you have no contiguous 512 4K pages and you try to allocate a huge page, you are going to own. The solution to that, of course, is for kernel to take all the free pages and essentially compact them. So it keeps as many contiguous pages as possible. And also this applies not just to huge pages, it even applies to higher order pages because not all allocation is order zero pages. So I refer to a, a page order, that's a buddy a, a allocator thing. Essentially what buddy allocator does is it uh, keeps a list of pages that are contiguous. So order zero page is a single page. So these uh, order zero pages potentially are in the memory non-contiguously. Order one page is a two page. Uh, order is really what you put as power of two. So order two uh, page would be a, uh, four contiguous pages. So buddy allocator keeps a list of all these contiguous pages. And some of the subsystems in the kernel, I've seen um, drivers, especially RDMA driver, request higher order pages. Instead of allocating order zero pages, many of these drivers will allocate order two, order three, order four pages. And if you don't have enough contiguous pages because you have a high fragmentation, you're gonna own. The solution to that is really K compact. Uh, 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 the solution is compaction of the memory. Compaction of the memory is done by a kernel thread, which is K compact D. And K compact D, can at times fail to keep up uh, uh, with the memory demand. And uh, when that happens, you end up with memory, enough memory available, but none of it is contiguous. So it, an allocation fails. So somehow you have to stay ahead or the K compact D has to stay ahead of the memory allocation. That was a topic of my talk uh, on uh, reclamation and uh, compaction, how to, um, the adaptive MM tool that I wrote, it's a demon that uh, looks at the memory consumption pattern of the system currently. And based on that, it projects what its memory consumption pattern is going to be in the future. And then it computes, are we going to end up in a situation where we don't have enough memory at the time when a, an allocation request comes in? When the allocation request comes in, you are going to go either into a stall, waiting for memory to become available, either through compaction or a, a reclamation, or uh, you will own. And so uh, adaptive MM uh, essentially looks for the potential of these events in the future and will kick K compact D and um, K swap D to reclaim memory and compact it proactively. Yes, uh, uh, the recording of the previous talk is actually on the LF Live mentorship series webpage. Okay, the next question is, as a sysadmin, from time to time, I have seen runaway processes that consume memory and seem to continue holding on to that memory even after the process is long gone. Which counters are best for investigating this issue or issues re, uh, related to reclamation of memory or is rebooting the only option? Um, well, it depends upon where the memory is locked up. If a process dies and its pages are left out in the memory with a reference count that is non-zero, uh, 
That's typically a kernel bug. Any page with a reference count that is non-zero, you cannot reclaim it because that reference count is saying it's in use, leave it alone. What happens more often is really a process dies, its pages were in the page cache, process has died, we uh, uh, reset the ref count for all the uh, pages it held in page cache to zero, but those pages are now consumed in the page cache, we haven't reclaimed those yet. Mm. The way those pages will be reclaimed is through KSWAPD. That's KSWAPD's job to go through the uh, uh, cache and reclaim all of these uh, this memory. You can kick system into reclaiming those uh, uh, pages. If you look in uh, proc, there is proc sys vm. Uh, under that, there is a file drop underscore cache. You can echo a number to uh, drop cache. Uh, one, I believe, uh, uh, check the documentation because sometimes I get them reversed. I think if you echo one to it, it will reclaim all slab uh, caches that can be reclaimed. If you echo two, it will reclaim all of the reclaimable pages. So uh, you can all those two together and echo a three, it will reclaim everything. It's a fairly destructive operation because if you echo three to drop cache, system will just sit there, first go through the entire cache and reclaim every page it can. So system may stall for a little bit while it does that. The second thing it does is, um, <clears throat> as we do IO to the file system, we are going to bring pages in, we'll hold them in the uh, buffer cache. And then even though whoever asked for that page is done with that page, we tend to keep these pages around because someone may ask for that page again. So why get rid of it? Uh, that's part of uh, how kernel maximizes use of memory. If there's memory available, nobody is using it, why not cache some data? So the next time it's asked for, it's already there in memory because you know reading from the desk or going over the net network, let's say it's RDMA, it's expensive. When you echo three to drop caches, what happens is kernel will go through and throw away all of these pages as well, which means if someone asks for that page again, that data from the desk again, kernel just threw away its cached copy, so it has to go to the desk. So there are side effects of doing that, but that's one way to reclaim all the memory. And I uh, do that as a debugging step at time. If someone says, I don't see free memory available after I've done a lot of other analysis, I might ask them, if the memory is logged up in page cache, let's see uh, um, if we can release it. Do that, if all the memory became available, okay, it was simply tied up in page cache, no problems, move on. So I have a question, uh, Khalid. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, so it, you don't you you might have a bug report coming in, and you don't always know. Uh, might you might not have a reproducer. You might have a scenario that this is what we see that causes this problem. So do you? Um, how do you go about maybe <clears throat> figuring out? You have to reproduce it, obviously. So, do you go through do process of maybe coming up with a a reproducer yourself? Come up with a write a test um, or a reproducer that could also be used at a regression test later. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Definitely, because if you can reproduce the problem on your own test system, that then you're golden. Now you can play with that test system. So. When a customer describes a problem, one of the things I indeed do is try to reproduce it on my own system. In this uh, specific case, uh, the uh, bug I talked about, I could not reproduce it on my test system. We have a test team. Um, they could not reproduce it on their uh, systems easily either. So uh, when you end up in that situation, you have a lot more limited options, but understanding what the workload was, what are the steps customers took, which ultimately led to this situation. Combining that information with what data you are seeing from the system currently, if you can come up with a way to reproduce the problem, that is the most helpful thing you can do for yourself. Now, uh, there's that uh, other uh, aspect to it. This is a, a problem that, uh, let's say, that's nasty. It results in a kernel panic. That's a nasty problem. Um, if it is because of a kernel bug, we don't want a, a such kernel bugs to go out into the field. So being able to take a reproducer and turn it into part of a regression test suite is definitely useful. So there's a, a kernel test suite in the kernel sources already. 
So anytime you can find a reproducer and you can rewrite the reproducer in a way where it can become usable as a regression test, that's a very good thing to do. Great. Um, I'm not sure if uh, this question in the Q&A is answered from Anthony. Yeah, I did uh, answer that question that uh, um, rebooting is not the only option. You can also use that uh, process uh, uh, VM drop cache file to drop the cache and see if you can recover the memory, uh, how to investigate this issue. That was the other thing. Um, there are uh, some counters that can be useful. So proc mem info will tell you how much memory is locked up in cache. So that's a useful one. M logged is another useful one because if it's a runaway process and it logged pages in memory and then went away, but somehow the uh, pages were never uh, unlogged, M log will tell you here's how much uh, memory that is just being consumed with no real users. Uh, another one I find useful is in proc VM stat, um, there are. Um, numbers under alloc stall underscore star, there's a whole bunch of these. So, uh, and then similarly, there's a, another uh, compact underscore star. These will give you counters of how many times we got stuck waiting to allocate memory. So when an allocation request comes in and system doesn't have enough memory available right away on the free list, I insert it has to go and reclaim memory. What happens is the process that requested memory goes into a stall while kernel goes and finds memory. So it will do reclamation, come back and say, okay, I have page available now here, but that is a stall and that causes a counter to increment. So this will tell you if that counter is constantly going up, especially at a high rate, you know, you are running into stalls very often, which means kernel is constantly having problems finding free memory. So that's a good counter to keep track of. And then uh, compact, there's another compact stall that will tell you when a process requested a higher order page, may have come through a, even a driver subsystem and a higher order page was not available. Kernel had to go into direct compaction, which is just a, a requester to hold on. Essentially, it's not going to return to the function. Insert kernel jumps to the um, uh, function that does a scan of the memory finds all the pay, uh, free pages and moves them, uh, uh, which is an expensive process because to move a free page from one location to another, it has to move the contents of the destination page elsewhere. So uh, it goes through this whole compaction process until enough higher order pages become available and then the kernel can satisfy that allocation request and return it, but uh, uh, return that pointer to the uh, requester. Whenever that happens, MM subsystem will also implement the compact stall counter. So looking at these two counters, you can get a feel for how often you are running into these uh, situations. So if you have runaway processes that are constantly re requesting memory, never freeing it, um, these numbers will keep going up. And then uh, there are a couple of other files. Let me see, I think I have them listed here. Ah. This, uh, the last file on this uh, slide, sys kernel debug ext frag ext frag index. That's a useful one. That tells you what is the current level of fragmentation on the system. Uh, there's a documentation file that tells you how to interpret those numbers. Take a look at that. See how bad the fragmentation is on the system. So, okay, so I'm just going to uh, uh, go over these uh, quickly since we are running out of time. Um, proc VM stat. Another useful one, take a look at the data I have here. Zone info, another very useful one, especially if you are looking at watermarks. If you're curious about water, what watermarks are, I explained that in my adaptive MM talk. Um, and then uh, these are some of the other interesting files um, that you can look at. They all have a bunch of data. It's useful to go through those. Uh, most of the data is explained either in a documentation file or just look at the code. And then there are a few debug tools, uh, ftrace, kprobe trace, these are available in the kernel, they are documented in the kernel uh, uh, documentation directory. Uh, they, uh, in, using these traces, you can see how often it, the kernel is hitting certain uh, function uh, entry points. DRGN, the dragon, that's an interesting one, that's a more recent one. It uh, 
it is a scriptable debugger that lets you do lots of very interesting things. Essentially, you uh, are it lets you insert code into the kernel, running kernel, and you can print counters, you can print events, you can actually read even kernel variables. Uh, using uh, Dragon. So take a look at that. There's a talk as well that happened a couple of years ago on Dragon that goes into more detail. And then, of course, Brendan Gregg's website has lots of performance monitoring and tracing tools. So since we are at 1027, uh, uh, I hope there are no uh, questions left unanswered at this point. I don't see any. Um, I'll hand it back to Candace for the wrap-up. Thank you so much, Khalid and Shua, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today, and a copy of the presentation slides will be added to the Linux Foundation website. We hope you are able to join us for future mentorship sessions. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.